production of Being Well is made possible in part by Sarah Bush Lincoln Health System, supporting healthy lifestyles, eating a heart-healthy diet, staying active, managing stress, and regular checkups are ways of reducing your health risks. Proper health is important to all at Sarah Bush Lincoln Health System. Information available at sarahbush.org. Rediscover Paris. Our patient care and investments in medical technology show our ongoing commitment to the communities of East Central Illinois. Paris Community Hospital Family Medical Center. HSHS St. Anthony's Memorial Hospital, delivering compassionate care close to home. From advanced surgical techniques and testing to convenient care for your family, we promise to make a healthy difference each and every day. St. Anthony's, together we are better. Thank you for tuning in for this episode of Being Well. I'm your host, Kian Armstrong, and today we're going to be talking about the topic of delirium. And joining me today is Dr. Ryan Jennings, and he is the Chief Medical Officer at HSHS St. Anthony's Memorial Hospital in Effingham. Thank you so much for joining us. That's my pleasure. That's a mouthful. It was, <laughs> but that's okay. Sometimes we have to start it off like that. I'm, I'm really glad you're here today because I'm thinking that the topic we're discussing probably affects a lot of people and a lot of family members as well. So do you want to start off by explaining what is delirium? Absolutely, you know, I, I think there's confusion about this, literally, it's a confusing problem. Uh, and what, delirium really is a, a symptom when somebody has an acute change. So as opposed to a family member that you see that has kind of a slow progression of losing their memory over a period of time, maybe months, maybe even years and years, that's really dementia. And you hear lots of conversation about dementia, especially Alzheimer's disease and things like that. But what we're really talking about today is when somebody has something acute happens that causes their mental status to change suddenly and uh, and really want to focus on ways that we can hopefully avoid that problem so the common things that I see are uh, basically uh, when somebody gets sick uh, you know as a physician obviously when somebody gets sick they come in and especially an older person the mind kind of tends to be the weakest link uh, and so they'll come in and the family saying you know they're not acting right they're forgetting things they may not even complain of symptoms that are related to whatever the infection might be it's more that they have this sudden uh, decline in their mental status. And with that then, they get disoriented, they don't know where they're at, uh, and so that kind of leads them on a pathway that can really be very challenging for the family members too, because now, uh, you know, dad or mom isn't even acting like themselves, and so sometimes they have behaviors that uh, are not typical of their um, even choice of words sometimes. <laughs> and of course, that can be very stressful for a family member that doesn't necessarily understand, hey, why is mom, why is dad acting this way? Um, and especially if the spouse is also an older person, then it adds stress to that person and, and you sometimes manifest even confusion in them at the same time. Yeah, so, there could be confusion uh, among all parties involved. Yeah, absolutely. So when you said that it's something when, you know, hey, my mom or dad's sick or a family member is sick, what are some of the symptoms that you see normally that leads into an acute case of delirium? Probably the most common th type of infection that we see in an older person is just a simple bladder infection. And you know, what normally in a younger person doesn't amount to much, you know, you have a little discomfort or something and they come into the doctor, get some medicine and they're better. In an older person, sometimes it manifests much more with this, this overwhelming confusion. And then you throw in the fact that when somebody gets sick, as you know, a family member, and you want to bring them to the hospital, it's an older person, so say, well, let's bring them to the hospital. Well, the hospital is the worst place in the world for taking an older person. I said uh, it's kind of like waking up in a hotel room when you're mm -hmm. you don't know, you don't know where you're at. Right. And, you know, we mess with their sleep cycle. We you know are in there drawing blood in the wee hours of the morning. Uh, we change their routine around their meals. Uh, we change medications on them. We change their entire care team. So. If there's someone that's coming from a, a skilled nursing facility or a nursing home, for example, they're used to seeing certain people in their lives. And all of a sudden, uh, we really 
disrupt all of that. And then that just tends to add to the confusion uh, even further. Now we work hard to try to minimize that and try to not disrupt sleep and kind of keep lighting appropriate. Uh, but for an older person, often that's a, a, a really difficult thing for them to deal with. And it's not benign. You know, sometimes we think that, okay, this person got confused. It's just a temporary situation. And over the next four or five hours or six hours or after we treat them, they'll come back completely around. Well, normally they do, but it really does cause significant mortality. About 60% uh, of folks that had an episode of significant uh, delirium during their hospital stay uh, will pass away within a relatively mm. short period of time. So it's not a completely you know, just innocent, I'm confused kind of situation. Uh, it really implies that there's something more serious in, in the sense that, uh, you know, the patient's got uh, at the point in life where these things all add up, you right. know, and, and start to take its toll. So. So how do you know as a family member whether your loved one is dealing with dementia or delirium? The key thing is really the timeline. Uh, so you know, a normal uh, progression of a dementia is very gradual over several years. They just kind of slowly get progressively more forgetful um, and, and just kind of gradually happen. In a delirium state, uh, something happens. You know, they, they again, they get sick. They have a surgery and then we give them pain medications and that confuses uh, the situation or um, they're involved in an accident or, you know, almost anything can then cause, uh, you know, kind of an acute change that again, hopefully is largely reversed. Uh, as opposed to most dementias, although Alzheimer's disease, we do have some treatment options for, uh, but most of the dementias tend to just kind of be gradually progressive. And even though sometimes we can slow it down, uh, sooner or later, you know, they, they continue to, to move along that, that kind of cascade of, of um, slowly losing their memory with time. Okay. Um, you presented me with a presentation that there's no place like home and you are advocating that you need to keep um, everything as familiar as possible to folks when they're in this horrible state of confusion. So what is the best route to take, whether a person is at home or in a skilled nursing facility? What What's the best thing to do. Sure, sure. And yeah, the no place like home is a little bit around being at home and a little mm -hmm. bit around uh, poor Dorothy's experience when she woke up in Oz. <laughs> you know, really confused. Yeah, What's going like on that. around here? Yeah, absolutely. And so, yeah, the idea is to hopefully be able to work with your physician so that if you're at home, uh, they can start to treat with medications in the home setting. Sometimes that can utilize home health if a patient's not able to go and, and go out, uh, you know, is homebound. Sometimes home health services can be utilized to go ahead and start some type of a treatment regimen, even for short-term antibiotics and things like that. Uh, certainly in a skilled nursing facility where, uh, you know, somebody that's already been staying in a nursing home, gosh, that's their home mm -hmm. uh, at that point. And that group of people that's around them become very much their family. And I think it, many, many folks, especially family members, don't recognize all the things that a skilled nursing facility can actually offer uh, their loved one while they're there. So oftentimes they call and they say, hey, you know, mom or dad or whatever, sick and their answer is well let's send them to the emergency room uh, when really a lot of times the, the nursing facility is able to go ahead and they can send off blood tests they can do x-rays uh, they can go ahead and start antibiotics or start other treatment options they can use IVs uh, and you know if somebody's just a little dehydrated they can give fluids without having to uh, again completely rip somebody out of their element uh, which then causes so much more confusion and and really prolongs their recovery recovery uh, as opposed to we've all kind of uh, anybody who's dealt with an older person experiences that magic of you know when you treat a, a urinary tract infection how quickly they just clear up and they're back to normal right uh, you know as opposed to bring them into the hospital and starting a treatment plan and then they've got confusion on top of confusion mm -hmm. uh, you know just from being put into an environment that they're not familiar with so taking advantage of the skill set of those nurses and, and other providers at the skilled nursing facility uh, is really, I think, an underutilized asset that would help us to keep people in the, as close to their home as they really possibly can be and still do it safely. You know, yes. I think the, these facilities are very smart about recognizing, hey, this is a situation, you know, a patient's having chest pain. Well, you can't take care of chest pain at a nursing home, but uh, some of the basic stuff that we see all the time, like mm -hmm. simple infections and, and even mild heart failure can really be managed uh, very, very appropriately at the skilled nursing facility.
Well, it's good to know that they offer such things so you don't have to take them to the hospital and, and put them through, you know, you, we hear the kind of the joke, you know, you can't get any rest in the hospital and you're already <laughs> tired going in, not feeling well, and then, you know, being confused on top of that. So it's good to know. I'm glad that you're giving that information to folks out there who may have a family member, a loved one um, dealing with this. And so if someone was thinking, you maybe this is the time that we should start looking at a skilled nursing facility. How do they do that and what are the best steps? Really, the best step by far is to go visit the facilities. Uh, you know, it's it's pretty amazing how much you can learn just by walking in the front door and speaking with the director of nursing or one of the administrators and taking a tour of the facility. Uh, the government, CMS, has done a very nice job of trying to kind of put together some quality metrics for skilled nursing facilities that are available out there on the internet. There's a nursinghomecompare.gov. Uh, but reality is you're talking about some place that you're wanting to make someone their home. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I wouldn't do that over the internet. <laughs> you know, I, I want to go visit go the facility. See what it looks Absolutely. Like. Meet, the people. Meet the people. And, you know, I always say there's there's a few things that, that you look for when you walk into one. One is that the residents are up, that the folks that are there, uh, you know, assuming it's a normal time of day, that they should be up. They should be up. They should be in the dining room. They should be in the game room. They should be dressed. Mm -hmm. Everybody shouldn't be sitting around in their pajamas if it's 10 o'clock in the morning. Uh, you know, it should look like a home. Uh, as opposed to, uh, you know, you go in and you see everybody's still in bed or they're still in their pajamas. Mm -hmm. uh, is the facility clean? You know, just basic things like that. I always think it's neat to get there around mealtime because, you know, you can kind of see how the food looks. Right. <laughs> and, you know, is it good? <laughs> yeah, does it smell good? You know, I, I, that, that really says a lot because you, you're really making a huge decision about finding a home, not just, uh, uh, you know, there are short stay things once in a while. You know, you just had a knee done and you just need a couple weeks of therapy. But even with that, you know, there you really want to find out how many of those do they do? Mm -hmm. You know, are, are you right. somebody that takes care of a lot of knees uh, or a lot of hips? And if so, then, you know, maybe that's the right place. If not, then maybe, maybe not. So, well, let me ask you this, because I think this might be a concern with some folks. Um, we're talking about skilled nursing facilities and what they offer with this topic. But what if, what if a family member doesn't want to go to a skilled nursing facility? What are their options there? They say, I want to stay at home. Sure, sure. Uh, unfortunately, there, there's limitations, you know, obviously financial limitations, because as the uh, Medicare recipients specifically, uh, there's certain requirements to be able to, to utilize your Medicare benefits towards skilled nursing and so sometimes it not qualifying under the Medicare program can make it really challenging for folks to uh, to stay in their home. We do have, um, uh, you know, various services throughout the community that can provide in-home assistance, in-home in -home aids and those types of things. The mass majority of those, are, unfortunately, are pay as you go. Um, there's not a lot of um, financial resources out there for uh, folks. Um, family members, you know, one of the things that I think is so challenging right now is uh, although our population, our aging population, especially the old, old, those that are 80 and 85 and up, uh, we're getting more and more and more, but their families were smaller than ever. Mm -hmm. And so instead of having 10 and 12 siblings that can serve as caretakers, uh, there may be only be one or two. And, you know, they're trying to raise a family. So that ability to, um, always lean on family is harder than it ever was. So uh, seeking th assistance out through other community resources like churches, uh, the Senior Center um, is a great resource, and, and there are some programs, but uh, you really need to spend some time with, with uh, somebody at the Senior Center to kind of walk through all the different options that might be out there. Okay. Um, we're talking about this topic with, um, I guess what we would say are senior citizens or those who are older. Does delirium happen to younger people as well? It definitely can, uh, you know, certainly in, in victims of trauma or burns and that type of stuff where there's very big metabolic disturbances going on, you know, where they've had to have blood and they've had to have lots of IV fluid and pain medication and, you know, kind of on and on and on and may have a, a you know, a traumatic brain injury on top of that. Uh, they can uh, experience episodes of delirium and they also um, ha have a significantly higher mortality if that tends to be the case. So as many as 80% of people that are in a critical care unit will have delirium during their stay. And so, uh, you know, everything that we can do to try to, again, normalize the environment uh, is hopefully will keep us from uh, aggravating what's already a very difficult situation. Okay. And um, 
is delirium hereditary or is dementia hereditary? Dementia I mean, definitely has some hereditary components to it and certainly folks who have a family member that developed dementia at a young age uh, you know need to be talking with their physician about what some options might be even research-based options because it's so uh, early in its infancy. Delirium, I don't know that there's a hereditary component. I can certainly uh, imagine that, that, again, if you've got a background uh, history of some dementia, then you throw anything at you, you're likely to have uh, a little bit more challenge than someone else. But, um, but like I said, the, the dementia uh, for a, a family that has it strongly in their family, they really need to be looking for it. More importantly, they need to be taking care of their brain. Mm -hmm. So just like when you go out to exercise your heart and your lungs and your legs and all your other muscles, you need to be using your brain and using your brain in ways more than sitting in front of the idiot box. I know I'm on TV, but you can't <laughs> <laughs> can't sit in front okay. of the TV. You know, all day long. You, yeah, you can't you know do what? that all day long. We, we start that with our PBS Kids programming and we say, you know what, you need a limited amount of time. Yeah. You got to go out and do some other things. It's Absolutely. good to educate yourself through television and entertain yourself, but there's lots of other things oh, yeah. that you need to do for yourself. And higher levels functioning, you know, balancing your checkbook, solving crossword puzzles, you know, yeah. uh, being social uh, really makes a big difference, which is again, part of where like the senior centers and things like that really benefit people tremendously because it keeps their brain sharp. Right, find activities that they enjoy. Absolutely. And just communicating and Absolutely. with one another. Yeah. Um, you mentioned um, a lot of other things that can lead into the symptoms. Um, you, you mentioned urinary tract infection and um, on your list that you showed me earlier, constipation, some other things. Mm -hmm. I list some of those different symptoms. So if someone is watching this program and they realize that a family member is suffering from some of these things and mm -hmm. they're thinking, well, could that be leading the into what, this? What led down yeah, the path? Yeah, give, give some more of those yeah, examples. So, so absolutely, I mean, any type of acute illness as far as any type of infection, whether that's an ammonia or that's a bladder infection or you know anything, just flu, uh, can actually cause significant problems with delirium. So the, one of the first things you go looking for is, is that, is an, is an acute infection. The second thing that we often go thinking about is electrolyte abnormalities or dehydration. So so, uh, you know, a lot of older folks don't get up and drink enough. Uh, you know, they're not getting enough fluids. And so that's not always one that you can completely figure out at home. Uh, but, but when we go looking for causes, looking for electrolyte abnormalities, dehydration, those types of things are huge. The third one, and maybe even more common than the other two in this day and age, is new medications. You know, somebody introduced a new medication, even if it's not a medication that you would expect to cause confusion. So perhaps I you know, you got started on a um, uh, just a plain old antibiotic and you don't think anything about it, well, it may interact with some of the other medications that, that the patient's already on and then put things kind of out of whack because of a drug interaction. And sometimes some of the medications that, it, that can cause it uh, are kind of surprising. You know, some of the bl just bladder medicine for people that have frequent urination, those medicines are terrible about causing confusion really? and imbalance. And even some eye drops, uh, you know, have uh, hmm. effects that can cause uh, confusion. So. Uh, uh, so medications is the next big thing. Um, and then you kind of get down into, yeah, some other things that you wouldn't necessarily think of, like just being constipated, you know, something that, again, puts them out of their element uh, in, a, in a significant way. Um, and of course, even so social stressors, you know, something that's going on in their lifestyle. I mean, we've seen, uh, you know, you've seen people that lost a pet and, mm -hmm. and it really impacts them mentally uh, and causes problems with their cognition. So losing a family member, losing a pet, uh, all of those types of things can help contribute to uh, an acute delirium. Okay, and so should a person, if they realize it themselves, or would they realize it themselves? So you see that sometimes. You'll see people, especially in the hospital, that they'll have periods where they're pretty good because the delirium can kind of go both directions. They can be very, very uh, out outward directed, you know, where they're very hyper uh -huh. uh, type thing and agitated and a real agitated state. And sometimes they just become very, very withdrawn and they just don't want to speak with anybody. And and so sometimes you'll see someone who kind of vacillates up and down during the course of their hospitalization and they'll be apologizing from the for the behavior that, you know, they exhibited when they were, you know, in this acute confusional state. And obviously they didn't have any control. That That's why they were doing what they were doing. So, so sometimes do folks do have insight, but it's usually family. 
family is usually the one saying, this is not the way, uh, you know, my loved one normally acts and what what are we going to do about it? Uh, right. Yeah. And that's what I was getting at. What do they do about it? Do they get a hold of their normal physician? Yes, absolutely. So they'd want to reach out to their doctor so that that doc could kind of start working through the idea of, okay, what precipitated the sudden change? You know, is, uh, is mom sick? You know, is, is there something going on here that tip the balance. Um, and again, if they're in a, a skilled facility, uh, they can really do a lot of stuff right there at the facility to kind of help guide the path and help the physician then to decide what the best treatment options might be. Okay, and they have social workers and things like that. They, they do, can absolutely. Talk to family members. They do, yes. Yeah, they do. They really do a great job with uh, kind of, I think it's become very interesting how much not just us at the hospital, but, uh, you know, excuse me, the um, skilled facilities as well are, are much more engaged in caring for the entire family than just the patient themselves because we realize that success for that individual patient uh, very often hinges very closely on the relationship with that family and their ability to continue to care for uh, their loved one because, again, it's a disruption to the environment. Yes, so. and it probably helps relieve the stress on the family as well as the patient because I would think that, you know, this is still a live, living human being that has feelings and even though they are in a state of confusion, you still need to re treat them with respect as, you know, as you would anybody else. Yeah, definitely. And, and that family feels uh, much more uh, engaged and validated that they're able to continue to be part of the care team. You know, if, if you come in and you just suddenly are submerged under the care of a doctor and nursing staff and the family doesn't get to participate in that, it doesn't go as well. And, and it certainly doesn't feel as good for the family. So. Right. Helps put everybody at ease Absolutely. a little bit. Um, I wanted to ask about, you mentioned palliative care earlier. Yeah. Can you explain that? Sure, yeah, palliative care, you know, there's a lot of confusion, I think, when we talk about palliative care versus hospice services. And as we have an aging population, we're seeing more and more illnesses that aren't necessarily something that's gonna kill a patient within six months, where you're normally talking about a hospice type situation where their life expectancy is dramatically shortened. We're really talking about diseases that they live with for sometimes decades. And we cannot cure, but we want to continue to care Mm -hmm. uh, for the patient in spite of that. And so making sure that we treat their symptoms to the best of our ability, uh, that we bring them those other resources so that it's you know not only the biological care, but it's the social aspects of it. It's the psychological support, it's the spiritual support uh, to really help that patient to start to recognize you know what's important to them mm -hmm. as opposed to what's the matter with them. There's a, there's a, there's, you know, we, we spent a lot of years treating what's the matter with people and we're slowly but surely starting to realize that we need to figure out how, and help them to understand what's important to them mm -hmm. because they realize they're going to live with some of these chronic diseases, whether that's heart failure or end stage lung disease or whatever. But what's important to them right then is that they want to be at their granddaughter's graduation or their, uh, you know, next anniversary or right. whatever that might be. And so uh, trying to figure out how we relieve symptoms to give them them as, as most productive and, and pleasurable life as they possibly can have uh, and understand what their wishes are. Uh, you know, last time uh, I was here, we actually spoke about the conversation project a little bit and this idea of trying to start the conversation with loved ones long before you have to be at the bedside making hard decisions. <laughs> so right. having that conversation and that way is difficult. in advance. Oh, it's terribly difficult, but it's, it's worse when you're at the bedside. Yes. <laughs> so as hard because as you it don't is, know what to do. Exactly. And as hard as it is to try to have those conversations way in advance, uh, boy, it sure is nice then when the time comes if you already have had that conversation and know what uh, your loved one wants. So that's the, the Conversation Projects tool is still out there on the internet. Uh, it gets a great resource to really help a family to help to understand what their loved one's wishes are towards the end of life and then how to make that successful for them when the time comes. Okay, that's good to know. We're almost out of time, so I want to know, if, have we covered everything? Is there anything that you want to mention that we haven't talked about to this point? No, I think we pretty well hit it. Uh, you know, I think uh, really uh, the the idea around recognizing the, the benefits of what the skilled facilities can sometimes do for us, uh, I think is probably one of the few, th one of the things that folks very rarely are aware of. Uh, and I think it's a message that we need to, to really help to share so that, again, we can help keep folks as close to their home as they possibly can be. Okay, so take care of yourself. If you notice that there's something going on, it may not be dementia, it could just be delirium. It could possibly be treated. Absolutely. And um, skilled nursing facilities are a route to take. 
keep people as close to their comfort zone and feeling like home. So that's pretty much the gist of, of our topic today. Yeah, absolutely. That's, right. that's what we need. Everybody wants to stay close to home. There's no place like there's home. There's no place like home. <laughs> no, there's not. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's, it's been a pleasure, pleasure talking to pleasure. you. And thank you so much for joining us for this episode of Being Well on Delirium. We hope you have learned a lot from this topic. And thank you again for watching. Production of Being Well is made possible in part by... HSHS St. Anthony's Memorial Hospital, delivering compassionate care close to home. From advanced surgical techniques and testing to convenient care for your family, we promise to make a healthy difference each and every day. St. Anthony's, together we are better. Sarah Bush Lincoln Health System, supporting healthy lifestyles, eating a heart-healthy diet, staying active, managing stress, and regular checkups are ways of reducing your health risks. Proper health is important to all at Sarah Bush Lincoln Health System. Information available at sarahbush.org. Rediscover Paris. Our patient care and investments in medical technology show our ongoing commitment to the communities of East Central Illinois. Paris Community Hospital Family Medical Center.